Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Oil Gas uh, Denmark for inviting me. I should also say that uh, when they invited me, I had a little bit of a problem because I was trying to imagine whether you were remotely interested in Formula One. And, and then I have to tell you that very secretly, Oil Gas Denmark arranged for Kevin Magnussen to join the McLaren team. And now I am told you are all completely fascinated uh, by my sport. So thanks very much for, uh, thanks very much for that. So um, great pleasure to be here. Um, I love talking about safety because having worked in um, Formula One since I left university, so uh, Tim is being very kind to me. I wish I'd only worked in the industry for 20 years. It's actually 31 years uh, now. And um, during that time, I've experienced lots of very interesting things. Formula One is uh, an exciting sport to be involved in, working with high-performing teams, uh, traveling around the world. Of course, Formula One is full of very sexy, glamorous people. <laughs> As you can see, uh, unfortunately, they couldn't be with me today. Um, and, and yet, when, when people say to me, what has been my most profound experience? Is it, is it winning a Formula One race uh, when I'm on the board of a Formula One team? Is it meeting drivers like Michael Schumacher or Ayrton Senna or Fernando Alonso? And I actually can honestly say that my answer is that the most profound thing in my career has been the safety uh, journey that we have been on. And that's really what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. It's, um, it's about safety within the, the Formula One context. Um, it's not obvious in your industry why someone from Formula One should come and speak. So I thought I would kind of start with a little bit of an introduction. Um, to give me a small advantage, can I just ask for a show of hands, how, how many people in the room have some kind of interest in Formula One or, or watch it? Oh, wow, that's good, that's good. Thank you, Kevin. Um, for the rest of you, uh, this is going to be quite a long session, okay? Because I have a PowerPoint presentation here, okay? Um, but let me tell you, first of all, when you turn on your television on a Sunday afternoon and you watch Formula One racing, uh, this is the first uh, race of this season in Australia, uh, what you see is a sports show. Uh, it's a sports entertainment show that we put on, and that's what consumers consume is our end product which is fun, exciting, entertaining. Uh, it's just, it's, it's slightly trivial, uh, I, I admit. It's not uh, serious life for most people, but it's, uh, it's an entertainment show. And, and I think there's an analogy there straight away into your sector because when consumers consume your products, they turn on the, the gas, they put the fuel in the car, they don't think about anything that has gone into making that happen. And that's very much the case in Formula One because there are 11 teams in Formula One and those 11 teams are engineering companies. So it is 11 engineering companies who design, manufacture and produce a product. It's, it's quite a complex product. It's a combination of technologies. It's aeronautical engineering, it's automotive engineering, it's information technology all integrated into building the product that we're going to take to market uh, to compete, to compete to win a race, to compete to win customers, sponsors, uh, to compete to win customers outside our industry because we sell technology solutions outside of Formula One into aerospace, defense, automotive, medical. So we are engineering companies producing products and selling them. And the reality is that um, when you visit a Formula One team like McLaren, and by the way, I did choose this photograph before. Um, I I've, I fully made the connection. Um, when you visit a Formula One team, you, you see several hundred people 
in the case of the McLaren Formula One team, about 650 full-time employees engaged in the design and manufacture of a product. And it's a product that is then going to be put into the hands of three employees, namely Kevin, his teammate Jensen Button, and their test driver, Gary Paffett. And those three employees are going to be sent to work in that product. And the full intention is that we go out and we concentrate on performance, uh, because performance is what we're looking for. And of course, performance of a driver like Kevin is what everyone's interested in at the moment in Denmark. Uh, but of course, there is a fundamental reality about what we're trying to do, because the first thing we want them to do is to come home. And, and that becomes the central pillar of how, as engineering companies, we design our product. We design our product first and foremost for safety. We design it secondly for reliability, because we want robust, reliable systems. And then thirdly, we are designing it for performance. So the McLaren at the moment is not a very competitive car in Formula One. They've got some work to do. But the one thing you're guaranteed is that it's a very safe product. Uh, it's, they're working on the reliability and the performance uh, will come. So that's the nature of what we do as businesses. Um, talking about Kevin and Jensen and Gary being the McLaren uh, drivers this year, it's interesting to look back at some of the famous names of Formula One over um, the last 40 years. And when I, when I was a child growing up in Northern Ireland, uh, I was born in Belfast, um, I, I became fascinated with this sport. And I followed every aspect of it. I was very passionate about it. And I had an awareness that it was dangerous. And I knew that the danger was actually something that it was part of, it was actually part of the spectacle. People watched it because of the danger. In some cases, I watched it because of the danger. But when I then was lucky to move into the industry and start working in Formula One, I began to think about what I was hearing from colleagues and co-workers, particularly some of the senior people. I started working in Formula One in 1983. And I started hearing stories about the danger and the safety issues and the lack of safety culture. And the fact that there was lots of work being done on safety, but somehow it was a, there was an accepted level of incident. There was an accepted level of danger. In fact, people used the word inevitable quite a lot. It was inevitable that we would have incidents. It was inevitable that we would have injuries. It's Formula One. You have 22 young, crazy guys driving 300 kilometers per hour against each other. And some of them are like Pastor Maldonado, if any of you know who that is, okay? They take a few risks too many, okay? Um, so it was kind of inevitable. So Peter Collins in the 1950s was the Jensen Button of the 1950s. He was English. He was extremely successful. He drove for Ferrari, and he burnt to death in, a, in an accident. Um, Jochen Rindt was the Sebastian Vettel of the 1960s. Hugely talented German driver. Um, drove for the Lotus team. Um, and at the Italian Grand Prix in 1970, his car suffered a failure. Um, and he was killed instantly uh, in the accident that followed. Um, what's interesting about Jochen is that he went on to win the championship. He's the only driver in the history of Formula One to have won the Formula One World Championship posthumously. And the presentation was made to his, uh, his wife. Francois Sever, um, probably one of the best looking Formula One drivers. I mean, he, he could have been a male model. He was such a good looking French guy, uh, hugely talented, very well educated, enormously popular with the fans, the media, 
Um, and he was mentored in his career by his teammate, who was Jackie Stewart. Uh, Jackie Stewart was a three times Formula One world champion, and Francois was a new guy, uh, the new guy into the, the team, and uh, Jackie really wanted to help him, and he mentored him. Um, Jackie Stewart had raced in 99 Formula One races. He had won three world championships. And in his 100th race, it was in Watkins Glen in New York, upstate New York. So his 100th race was going to be the United States Grand Prix. And during qualifying on the Saturday, Francois Sever made, an, made a mistake. So it was driver error. And his car went off the track. It hit a, a barrier. It hit a safety barrier, so-called safety barrier, but unfortunately it was a safety barrier that went up and over the car and he was decapitated. Jackie Stewart went to the scene of the accident and <clears throat> he witnessed the injuries and he retired from Formula One on the spot. He never did his 100th Formula One race. And I think when I hear Finn talking about safety coming from within and about the importance of the individual. I was beginning to learn about that when I was starting to work in Formula One from meeting people like Jackie Stewart and wondering why they were so evangelical about safety. And it was because they had personally experienced the downsides of our industry and it had impacted on them very critically. And then finally, Tom Price, who actually I included because of Tim. Tim's a very proud Welshman. Tom Price um, was a Welsh Formula One driver, um, and at the South African Grand Prix in 1976, he was, he was just beginning to really surprise everyone. He was fastest overall in practice in front of James Hunt and Nicky Lauda. Um, and then in the race, there was an incident on the track. There was a, a, an accident. There was a fire. There were two fire marshals, and the two fire marshals decided to run across the track to put out the fire. And one of the 19-year-old marshals ran in front of Tom Price's Formula One car. He, he couldn't understand the speed differential, and his 18 kilogram fire extinguisher hit Tom in the face, and he was killed instantly. The marshal was killed instantly in the collision, of course, as well. So I'm starting with some pretty grim stories, because I think coming from the world of Formula One, people say, it must be so exciting, it must be so sexy, and it is, it's very exciting, and it's very sexy. It's incredibly, interesting work. But the reality is that the foundation of what we do is based on the knowledge of what the potential outcomes can be when it goes wrong. As I say, when I started working in the industry, I, I heard about this and I saw some evidence. I met a couple of drivers who were in wheelchairs. I met a couple of mechanics who had very serious injuries they were disabled as a result of injuries that they had sustained working in Formula One. But the other thing about coming from Belfast in Northern Ireland is that um, growing up there in the 1970s, uh, we had a lot of trouble, as it, you may know, in Northern Ireland at that time. There was one sport that brought everyone together, and that was motorsport. We loved our motorsport. And that was, a, that was a really good thing to get involved in, which is one of the drivers for me. Um, I was saying to the guys last night, it's quite interesting when I go back to Belfast now and I see how everything has changed. And one of the comments I was making was that I noticed that Harland and Wolf shipyards, which I'm sure some of you uh, are familiar with, is now beside the biggest tourist attraction in the whole of Ireland, which is the Titanic Museum. Okay. So we have taken our biggest catastrophe and we have turned it into a celebration, which is quite interesting. And they are selling t-shirts in there which say, the Titanic, engineered in Belfast, captained by an Englishman. 
which I thought was quite nice. Um, but growing up in Belfast and getting interested in motorsport, uh, when I was 14 years old, I made a new friend. He was 12 years old. His name was Martin Donnelly. And as I grew up and I moved into management and leadership in Formula One teams, he grew up and he became a Formula One driver. And he actually, you know, we both achieved our ambitions in life. I'd, I'd be perfectly honest. We both got to a point where we looked at each other and we said, my goodness, we made it. You know, we got to Formula One. Um, his first year in Formula One was driving for the Lotus uh, Formula One team in 1990. Um, and I was very proud of his achievements. He was just an su absolutely super guy. Um, and incredibly determined, very focused, uh, a great team player, uh, very conscious about safety, uh, uh, really worked hard with the engineering community to get the most out of the product. And then at the uh, Spanish Grand Prix in September of that year, um, he suffered a, he made a mistake. So another error, another human error, he made a mistake. And when his car hit the wall at 300 kilometers per hour, the car disintegrated completely. It destructed and he was, he was thrown out and he suffered unbelievable injuries. Um, I spent the next six months visiting him in hospital every week. He was in a coma for two months. Um, he suffered a wide range of injuries. Um, amazingly, he recovered. Um, and I still see him from time to time. Um, and every time I see him, I'm reminded that this was my introduction, not from hearing about it, but from experiencing it firsthand. Suddenly, it became very personal. And really, from that moment onwards, I began to realize that here was something that needed to change. Because I had just seen my best friend almost killed and certainly permanently disabled. I mean, he is permanently disabled because of what we do. And suddenly, our euphoria and our sense of achievement and our sense of uh, purpose went out the window, and it was all about staying alive. The first driver to arrive at Martin Donnelly when he was lying on the racetrack, injured, was the Brazilian uh, driver, Ayrton Senna. And he got out of his car, and he went to the scene, and he joined the medical team who were trying to resuscitate uh, Martin. And he watched very closely as they went through the procedures to, to, to get an airway uh, into him to recover his tongue. He had swallowed his tongue during the accident. A um, number of other injuries that had to be attended to. Um, and Senna was very affected by that. And for the next years, Ayrton Senna became the head of the Drivers' Committee on Safety. And he took it very personally to, to try and develop safety in its broadest context within, within our industry. Um, it's quite ironic uh, that, that that is what happened, uh, because as many of you will know, he subsequently lost his life. And this is really a kind of pivotal point in my discussion. And if I've been intentionally very serious up until now about these stories I'm telling you, there, that, that there is a reason for that. I'm trying to I suppose, communicate how in an industry like mine, just as like in an industry like yours, we are really concerning ourselves about the same things. We are seeing things which are not acceptable. We're trying to drive to zero the potential for fatal accidents. We're trying to drive to zero the potential for injuries. We want to understand why incidents happen. We want to understand why people make mistakes. We recognize that people make mistakes. My best friend, Martin Donnelly, made a mistake. It ended his career. It nearly ended his life. Francois Severe made a mistake. It ended his life. So we know people make mistakes, even supremely talented people, even supremely well-trained people make mistakes. So it becomes about handling the human condition. Because no matter what you do in terms of technology and systems and processes, it's what's in here 
and this is why I think the safety comes from within message is such a powerful one, because it really does. It's, it's, it's in here. Um, so we get to a weekend in Italy, in San Marino, in 1994. I was on the management board of the Jordan uh, Formula One team. Um, and on the Friday, one of my drivers was very seriously injured, Rubens Barrichello. He had a very serious accident. Um, again, suffered a number of injuries, but he was, he was okay. On the Saturday, another very good friend of mine, Roland Ratzenberger from Austria, uh, was killed instantly in an accident during qualifying. Again, he made a mistake. He had driven the car off the track um, for several hundred meters on the previous lap. And our protocol, our safety protocol in Formula One from really about the early 1980s was that if you go off the track, you must bring the car back into the team to, to do an engineering check to make sure everything is still working and serviceable and that there's no damage. But he felt a lot of pressure. He was under pressure to perform. He was under pressure from his sponsors to perform. He didn't want to waste the time to come back in and have the car checked. So he didn't come in and have the car checked. He went on to the next qualifying lap, hoping that there was no damage. And that was a fatal decision, because there had been damage. The car failed at maximum speed, and he was killed in the, in the accident. Um, and then, of course, the next morning, we have the Grand Prix. By now, we are all very depressed. Uh, it's been a terrible weekend. We can't believe what's happening. Um, and then in the, act, in the race, Ayrton Senna is leading the race for Michael Schumacher, and his car suffers a failure, and, and he's killed. And all I can say to you is that think of the worst catastrophe that you've witnessed, experienced, observed, been involved in, reported on, that, that is your kind of point in your life and you say, there was a time before that and then there's the time after that. Well, this was our time, this was our weekend. The history of my industry can now be plotted in everything that happened between 1950 and 1994 and everything that happened since. That was our key moment. That was when we drew a line in the sand and said, we cannot continue to do this. We need to change. And it needs to be from the top down and the bottom up, and it has to be everyone, and we've got to find a way. We are clever people. We are, my goodness, how clever are we? Look at the technology we can produce. If we can produce this technology, surely we can produce the safety that goes hand in glove with that. Um, one of the things about Formula One is that when we have incidents, when we have an accident like that, everyone sees it. Uh, and in the case of Ayrton Senna, um, his accident was, of course, visible not only on TV, but we could, we could actually sit in the cockpit with him on the last lap of his life and see the moment when his car failed uh, and went off the track. Um, and that's kind of quite a visceral thing to consider, that we can watch that. Um, I was told by someone from the BBC, and I, I don't know if it's true, but I was told by someone from the BBC that on May the 1st, 1994, when Ayrton Senna was killed live on television, it was the largest live audience globally for a fatality in the history of television. There had not been a previous incident of a fatality being broadcast globally live up until that point. Obviously, we've had lots of things since. Uh, think of 9-11. Um, but that accident was watched by 200 million people. And when we began to look at how to stop this, how to, to change direction fundamentally, we realized that we, we actually have quite a lot of tools. 
actually know a heck of a lot about what causes these things to happen. We know a lot about our technology, and so we know the, we know the physics of our technology. We know that when a vehicle fails at 320 kilometers per hour and has an accident, we know what will happen in that accident. We know the trajectory of the vehicle. We know the strengths of all of the components. We know how that accident is going to unfold. We actually have a huge amount of certainty. And one of the things that we had always been doing in Formula One between 19, really from about 19, 1988 onwards, was building up a huge amount of data, a lot of information about the performance of our systems. Performance management, obviously hugely important. So data systems, telemetry systems, data acquisition, fundamental technology within our industry. We have teams of people watching computer, computer monitors to see exactly how our vehicle is performing. They're, they're looking for anom anomalies. They're looking for opportunities, how to improve performance, how to mitigate risk. So these data engineers who sit at the back of the garage, uh, they, ne they never watch a Formula One race on TV. It's actually quite funny. Sometimes they will come up to me after the race and they'll say, who won? They're just looking at data. They just want to know exactly how the gearbox is working. They just want to know exactly how the hydraulic system is working. That's their job. And they're in radio communications with the engineers, and the engineers are in radio communications with the drivers, and we have this seamless flow of data, of communications, of technology. It's all very clever stuff. But we had only been using it for one thing, performance management. And on the Monday morning after that weekend, we woke up and realized we had to change, and we realized that actually maybe the clue to changing is to getting hold of the intel, the data, the information that can help us to know how to change. And actually, it's, it's all here. We've, we've actually got all the information. And when we put it together, we can, we can replay an accident from inside Ayrton Senna's car. We can see the television image. We can even see the television, the, the, the video image from Michael Schumacher's car behind him. So that, that's Ayrton Senna, and this video was taken from Schumacher's car. And of course, we then have our data, our data streams. I apologize about the resolution on this image, but it's actually quite an important video, because this is the video clip that was assembled by the Italian prosecutors who started a 13-year legal case against the Williams Formula One team over the death of Ayrton Senna. So that accident had implications on so many levels. Someone lost their life. There was a human cost. Uh, the team lost some sponsors. There was a commercial cost. People don't like to hear about the commercial realities of accidents. There is one. Reputationally, and actually a little known fact is that 13 years later, the technical director of the Williams Formula One team was found guilty of manslaughter, and the Williams team guilty of corporate manslaughter over that accident. 13 years it took. And this was the video shown in the court. The court assembled this because the court, the, the prosecutors wanted to understand what happened. And the Williams Formula One team and Formula One itself worked to put this together so that we could simultaneously play everything that was happening and understand from the data, from the images. And then we began to mine that information. And when we mined that information, we, be, we, we, we discovered the reason for the accident. The reason for the accident was that the ste steering on the car failed. And when they looked into the reasons why the steering on the car failed, they discovered that on the Saturday, Ayrton Senna had complained about the steering and the fact that it was rubbing against his knee, the steering column. And so he asked for a localized modification to be made 
and one mechanic and one junior engineer, relatively junior engineer, made the decision to modify the steering column without any reference back to engineering. So fundamental failure of quality engineering and process. Local decision. Why did they do that? Well, when they were interviewed, they said, because Ayrton Senna is a superstar, because he's a superstar employee and in a position of great leadership, when he asks for something, we do it. So they had pressure. They felt pressure coming from him. Not, not in a negative way, in a positive way. And so they responded by doing the, the local modification he requested. And guess what? That's exactly where the steering column failed. So again, human decisions led to that. Unfortunately, Ayrton Senna's own decision. What happened after? I love this photograph because what happened after that accident was that as an industry, we responded. And the really interesting thing is that the leadership of Formula One, Bernie Eccleston, who is the, he owns the commercial business of Formula One. He got together with Max Mosley, who was the president of the FIA, and on the Tuesday, 48 hours after that accident, they issued a statement in which they said that their ambition, indeed their target, was to innovate to zero the likelihood of further fatalities for Formula One drivers. And I remember reading that and thinking, wow, what a great target, but how ridiculous, because it's inevitable that we will have more accidents. It's inevitable that we will have more injuries and fatalities. But I like this photograph because there's, if you can read body language, you can see who's in control here. And it's not Bernie. It's Professor Sid Watkins. Because Bernie and Max Mosley said to Professor Sid Watkins, head of neurosurgery at the Royal London Hospital, we want you to come in and head up our safety committee to work out how to stop killing human beings who drive our products. We want you to tell us how you want us to design our cars, to design our circuits, to design our infrastructure. We want you to employ the best people. We want you to put it center stage and we want all of the teams to work together with you. This was quite an interesting idea. The notion that 11 engineering companies who compete bitterly against each other are now going to work together and work together for one area, and that is safety. And from that week onwards, that's exactly what happened. And it's wrong to say that one person changed everything. But if you said to me who was the most important person in changing the safety culture, it was Sid. And the reason was because he had personally experienced it over and over again. He was the person who tried to resuscitate Ayrton Senna. He was the person who resuscitated my friend Martin Donnelly. He was the person who declared Roland Ratzenberger dead. Sid had been through it. And he said, I remember him saying to me very clearly, you know, I'm an eminent neurosurgeon. He said, I'm very skilled at what I do. He said, my ambition is that they will never need me ever again. I want it to be zero. And so we began to change our technology, our products, how we design a car. Let's design a car for an accident. Let's design a car that when it has that accident, which is inevitable, it will withstand the accident. Let's redesign the infrastructure within which our employees are operating, the racetracks of the world. And over the next 20 years, as we build, built brand new tracks like uh, in Abu Dhabi, in Bahrain, in Singapore, in China, in South Korea, in India, we developed a template, a template for how the track would operate, but fundamentally a template for how safe the track could be made to happen in order to ensure that in any incident, a car is not going to have a perpendicular impact with a wall. If it does hit the wall, the wall will be made of certain materials. The car will destruct in a certain way. Everything is geared towards making sure that we recover and mitigating the outcome. 
So it's about prevention. It's also about mitigation. It's about the infrastructure and our products. It's about the safety equipment. I mean, your teams, every photograph I see, safety equipment's very important. Obviously, in Formula One it is, but, we've, but we haven't stopped developing that safety equipment. Um, probably, the, probably the biggest step in safety equipment after Roland Ratzenberger's accident and Ayrton Senna's accident was the introduction of the hands device. And every Formula One driver wears this. It's made of carbon fiber. The seat belts, the seat belts go over it. And this holds the back of the head and is actually tethered to the helmet. And you might say, well, that seems like a, an utterly counterintuitive thing for a driver to have. Drivers surely need freedom. But actually, there's, there's enough movement for the driver. The purpose of this technology is to stop the one kind of fatal injury which, up until this point, had proven impossible to tackle, and that is rotational, high-speed rotational, high-energy impacts. Roland Ratzenberger didn't have a broken bone in his body when he was killed. He was killed by the fact that his neck just snapped when the car hit the wall. This pr protects that from happening, and it decelerates the head on impact. Every driver wears that, and it's mandatory. And we also introduced some things which are quite interesting when you think about them. Um, you've all heard of the safety car. It's quite interesting when you step back and think about that. The safety car, that's what we call it. It's not called the pace car or the showing off car or you know the car to show the drivers what to do. It's called the safety car. The safety car has the full control of the race. We can stop the race, we can slow it down, and of course we have our high-speed medical cars. Why do we have high-speed medical cars? Because we, we want to mitigate the outcome of incidents. We know that getting assistance to drivers when they've had an accident as fast as possible is absolutely critical. And actually, Sid Watkins came up with this idea. And in the medical car, we have a neurosurgeon, an anaesthetist, and a trauma doctor. And that medical car follows the Formula One cars on the first lap of every race, because the first lap of the race is the point of highest incidence of major accidents. And the, and the objective is that within 20 seconds of an accident happening on the first lap of the race, the medical car will be on site and ready to help with extraction and, and uh, a trauma care. Um, there's quite a funny story about this. When Sid introduced the uh, medical car, he decided to test it out in Brazil uh, by having it in a, in a saloon car race, a touring car race. Um, and he asked Emerson Fittipaldi um, if Emerson, a re retired Formula One driver, he asked Emerson if he would drive the car. Um, and Emerson agreed. And Sid tried to explain to Emerson that the point was to stay behind the field <laughs> on, on the first lap. Um, unfortunately, Emerson's kind of adrenaline and his, uh, his old habits kicked in. It was raining, okay? And because the medical car was filled full of medical equipment, it was quite heavy, so it had lots of traction. And um, Sid said, two things happened. He said, at the end of the first lap, we didn't go back into the pits. We continued. Um, secondly, we were in 11th position um, in the race. And he said, I couldn't help but feel sorry for the drivers out there who had been overtaken by the medical car, uh, which is going pretty quickly. But I mean, think about all of these things added together. We have tackled, we've had the, the leadership have mandated zero. We've changed our infrastructure, our systems, our equipment. We've developed new processes, buddy systems, checklists for everything. So we've gone a long way. Um, and when we have an accident like this, this is Robert Kubica in 2007. This is, a, this is four impacts. He hits the back of a Toyota. He hits one wall. He hits a second wall. This is the worst kind of incident that you can have in a Formula One car. Um, and he survived. He walked away from that accident. 
Actually, he didn't. He had a cup of tea with the track marshal, and then he walked away. Um, and he came back, and he won that Formula One race the next year. He survived that. He would have definitely been killed if that had happened a few years previously. And what's really interesting, therefore, is that we have found a way to stop killing our drivers through technology, through systems, through infrastructure, through training, through urgent emergency response. And our learnings have been so profound that the European Union, World Health Organization, now gets Formula One to develop all the Euro NCAP and all the safety crash testing that we are all benefiting from is run by Formula One. It was set up by Max Mosley, Bernie Ecclestone, and the European Union two years after Senna's accident. And every car that we drive on the road today has been crash tested. And it's quite interesting to consider that the learnings have come from Formula One and that Formula One did that because of the deaths of Erkan Senna and Roland Ratzenberger. But I now want to finish with the individual and the teams. Because, you know, we are teams of people. And we can have the infrastructure, we can have the technology, we can have the systems and processes. We can have our leadership setting us high ambitious targets to innovate to zero. But it comes down to every person. It's what I said earlier on. It, it does come from within. And we understand, that very, we understand that very closely because of the environment that we're working in. Mistakes are very obvious. When a mistake is made uh, in a team, the outcome can be quite profound, um, you know, catastrophic. This is a very famous incident uh, with the Benetton Formula One team. Uh, it was, again, it was caused by people. It was caused by two individuals. The day before the race, they decided to uh, recondition, uh, service the refueling equipment, but they decided to shortcut the process. The reason they shortcut the process was that one of them had a, had a, a date. He had a, a, a young lady waiting for him at the hotel. He wanted to get home early, so he decided to speed up his job and, and shortcut the process. They also eliminated one of the valves in the systems because they decided it was slowing down the fuel flow, which it was. It was slowing down the fuel flow for safety reasons, and they eliminated it. They thought they were being clever. They were looking for performance. What they got was a catastrophe. And I think this kind of incident really helped us because as part of our continuous improvement and focus on safety, we take every incident and we see what can we learn from that because that then becomes an incredibly powerful tool. Um, I mentioned earlier on the fact that we have superstars in our teams. The danger about superstars in any organization, be it the boss or be it somebody who thinks they've got 30 years experience more than anyone else, is, is it has to apply to everyone. And in Formula One, of course, we have our superstars in the case of a driver. So when drivers make mistakes, we actually love that because it's our way of bringing them down to, uh, down to earth. This is a lovely mistake that Lewis Hamilton made at the Malaysian Grand Prix, coming in for a pit stop. Um, unfortunately, he forgot who he was working for. Um, and, uh, and that was slightly embarrassing. Um, actually, very serious for Mercedes, because you know Mercedes, he, he, would have, he would have finished third in this race. I so wish the McLaren team had just simply taken his wheels off and <laughs> left, him, uh, left him in the box. Um, and then you look at the fact that once we get everyone aligned around the fact that they have individual personal responsibility and accountability and that safety comes from each one of them working together just as the performance of the car comes from each one of them, what we have found really interesting is that the more we have looked at the detail of improving systems and safety, we've also been able to, in parallel, improve performance. Because we've had the confidence to go further, to go faster. Because the safety is, is the foundation of what we're doing. When I started working in Formula One, pit stops took eight seconds. And eventually we got them down to six seconds. And then refueling was banned. 
And when refueling was banned, we only had to change the tires and adjust the wings. And the Ferrari Formula One team asked their crew of people to try and get a pit stop down to three seconds. And I remember hearing this and thinking, they are nuts. Three seconds, impossible. Um, and at the Korean Grand Prix um, two years ago, they achieved just that, which was very nice for them, not so nice for the rest of us. Um, and when you look at that, three seconds, 22 people, one, two, three, gone. Fantastic. And yes, they did change the wheels, in case you didn't notice. Um, and when you look at this from the point of view of just a slow motion replay, think about what's going on in the head of each of these people. They have a task to perform. They have no time to check what their coworker is doing. They all have to work seamlessly. They all have to work safely. The pit stop is only going to take as long as the slowest person. And you really don't want to be the mechanic who drops the wheel nut and watches as it rolls across the pit lane. Don't worry about the 200 million television viewers. Worry about your co-workers, because you're going to have a difficult conversation with them later on in the bar. And finally, one of the things about this relentless focus on safety, of getting the individuals in the team to understand what our priorities are, more performance, don't forget the safety. In fact, don't forget the safety. Put your safety first. We don't want to do anything that's going to compromise that. We, don't, we all want you to come home. And at Red Bull, which rather strangely is the dominant team in Formula One of the last four years, so they might produce a quite disgusting energy drink, but my goodness, they can make a great Formula One car. Um, but they make that performance possible because of their teams of people and what they're getting out of them. And I can tell you, I have never met a more focused group of people who understand their priorities. Blame culture? They wouldn't know how to spell the word blame at Red Bull. If they make a mistake, they're more likely to appoint that person to be head of whatever that was that he made a mistake in, because they know that person will never make that mistake again. I can tell you other teams where if you make a mistake, you get fired, you get demoted, you get put in another job. That's why those teams are not performing. Red Bull invest in their people. The communication is open, transparent, two-way, and they just want to learn how to be the best in the world. And so they are the best in the world. And their response to Ferrari was, was this, this was in Malaysia last year, one, two, gone. Um, that was two seconds. So they took a second off Ferrari. Um, and actually, I know that the team manager of Red Bull met the team manager of Ferrari in the bar at the airport the next day, and he went up to him and he said, I'd like to buy you a drink because you really need to work on those pit stops. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, and you know, when you look at that, I want you to look at the people down here. Just look at these guys. The celebration. That's from within. That's people knowing they have delivered. They have done an amazing job. And they know it. They don't need a stopwatch. They don't need the leadership to say you did a great job. They know they've executed that safely, reliably, seamlessly, ultimate in performance. And that's what we want to get from our people. And it's instilling that passion in them that's important. After they achieved that, that team of 22 people within themselves became completely focused on doing even better. And they spent April, May, June, July, August, September, October of last year trying to beat that record. And at the United States Grand Prix in November, they managed to, to achieve the first ever Formula One pit stop in less than two seconds. And my message here is that for Formula One teams, in the quest for performance, which we don't want to compromise on, we have learned that in the quest for safety, which we don't want to compromise on, they can be partners. They don't need to be mutually exclusive. 
They actually can help each other. And when you talk about individuals, just watch. This is the pit stop. Just watch the trust and the faith and the operation that these guys put into that stop. It's amazing. It is amazing. But these are not superstar, multi-million dollar drivers. These are ordinary mechanics and technicians doing an extraordinary job. And that's the thing about our people, and that's the thing about your people. They are amazing. They do an extraordinary job. And that's why, for us, it's so important that we do everything to look after them, and why, for me, the most profound journey that I've experienced in my Formula One career is that I can stand in front of you today and say that 20 years after Ayrton Senna was killed, the 47th fatality of a Formula One driver, we have not had one since. 20 years. That's been a journey worth going on. Thank you very much.